Hello, it's time. Someone told you you should be doing some kind of model for your data. And you thought to yourself, hey, I'm gonna do a GLM because that seems like the easiest thing to do. And you do your GLM and you run your GLM and you're like, what does this mean? And things look significant, so whatever. Copy and paste the table, put it in your results, done. I'm here to help you understand, first of all, how to interpret what in the Sam heck your output table from your GLM you've run says. I'm gonna tell you how to be critical of your own models, look at them, understand what's happening, and you then are the master of your own fate Conscious is on your side. You decide if this is right or wrong. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to start off with loading some packages. Let's get this bread. Okay, and then Dharma. This is the single most important package you'll be using. I've used it for every single paper that I've published. And what it does is that it checks for your model's uh, correctness, let's say for now. Moving on. To this modeling business. We are going to start with the data frame that I know, you know, your mom knows it, and it's the iris data frame. We love iris. Iris is already in R. Just to give a very, very, very brief overview, iris is our beautiful data set, classic, um, where we've got species of different irises that all then have different measures of the petals and sepals and different parts of them. First, I'm gonna name it. I'm gonna call it model one. I'm gonna pull up GLM, brilliant. What, what do we do now? Well, we wanna know sepal length, you know? Um, and then we're gonna do this little tilde, the tilde. That's the predictor between the X and the Y. I'm saying pretty much the question is here, do different species of irises have different sepal lengths? Um, and I'm also going to obviously specify my data frame and then we're going to run it. And the first thing we do when we run a model uh, and it's been stored, now we look at the output. If this is your first model ever, you might be very excited, very, you know, this is cool, right? I have an entire table of significant data. This is where the problems start. People just look at the stars and kind of move on. And so that's what we're not going to be doing today. Let's start breaking this table down piece by piece. Some things have changed here, and that's just because for my next explanation, it's good to have a visual aid. So you're going to be noticed first thing, once you get over this whole star business, that all of a sudden, one of our, one of our species has gone away. What is this about? So we see Versicolor, we see Virginica. Where did Satos go? Well, my friends, Setosa is now your intercept. So when we're doing a model, all the values are compared to our intercept. Our intercept right now is Setosa. Um, what this is saying, right, when we look at it, we have the estimate. The estimate is for every, is essentially the slope. And so for every unit, one unit of change, uh, it's that amount of increase or decrease. Compared to Setosa, Versicolor is 0.93 more. So their sepal is significantly longer than that of Setosa. And then if we look at Virginica, it's the same thing, but to an even larger degree. Oh, look, Virginica is 1.58 times for every one unit of change larger than the Setosa. We can change what we're comparing the value to. So we could re-level it to look at Versicolor. And actually, let's do that right now, uh, just to kind of show you guys that this thing, these comparisons are something that you set and you're kind of the master of. Something, you know, quick and dirty. Um, I'm gonna rename, I'm gonna make a new column. And I'm just gonna say relevel. Um, and I'm going to say, uh, please relevel the iris uh, species. And please put Versicolor first. Um, and the reason I want that is because it's in the middle and I think that will be interesting. We're gonna run a second model, which is going to be exactly this, the exact same thing, 
except of course we're going to use our new data frame. Now see it's Setosa and Virginica. And what do we see? When versicolor is our intercept and everything's being compared to that, we now see, oh look, this is negative because it's significantly smaller. And Virginica is positive because it's significantly larger. So if you want to start calculating these differences and these values actually have meaning to you, you know, if we have our base value of 5.9, this is this much smaller than that versus when we're talking about slopes and this is that much larger, then it's really interesting to arrange and wrangle your data in a way that makes these comparisons more interesting for you. Uh, while we're here at this middle chunk, we also have our standard error. Error around the slope, how much fuzziness is around it. So of course, smaller values are always going to be better. T value is actually just the estimate divided by the standard error. Prove to you that I'm not a liar. Um, so 0.9, yikes, 0.93 divided by, divided by 0.103 equals 9 point, negative 9.209, whatever, um, and that's this value. When we start thinking about t values, right, um, this is our standard error, right? This value is this value. So would a larger t value or a smaller t value be better? Well, let's think about it. If we have smaller standard error, that means there's less uncertainty, right? So let's say our standard error was 0 0.05, like tiny, tiny, tiny. When we run that, it's larger, right? Of course, it's more negative, but the absolute value is larger. So these values, these T values that are larger, we tend to have more confidence in. So my favorite parts, I think it's actually one of the most interesting, which is the comparison between the null deviance and the residual deviance. So the null deviance is the null model. It means what happens, what are the results, if we just look at sepal length in comparison to, to nothing, to just sepal length to itself, does how different is it? Um, you're going to notice there's 149 degrees of freedom. Where does that number come from? Well, you'll conveniently see that there's 150 rows of observation. In comparison, we have the residual deviance. So what happens when we start taking the predictors of the model into account? So the relationship between the null deviance and the residual de deviance is actually your chi-square. I'm not going to get into this because that is more stats and that is not what we're here for today. Where did that number come from? Well, gotta say, 150 observations minus 3, 147. So we're starting to kind of break open the black box here. The sepal length this is our null model just looking at the intercept at the y-axis. And you're going to see, oh, look, the null deviance and the residual deviance are the same. And also to kind of better illustrate what I am talking about when I'm saying we're just looking at the Y intercept, look at this value of 5.83, whatever, right? That's our intercept. There's no other lines because there's only, th this is all we're asking. But this measure, where does this number come from? 5.84, where, where the heck did they get that? because that's the intercept. This measure is the overall mean of all of the sepal lengths when we only are looking at this, white, this y axis. We're not really looking at the, at the species anymore. That is what the null model is. Means within each species, these red dashed lines, see the comparison from the before and the after, right? So that intercept model originally is that group mean across all the samples and then if we actually start to take species into account, see how these lines are changing. The last thing are the deviance residuals. It's actually the first line um, of, of your output when you first run a model. The reason why we might be interested in this uh, summary is to see how well our model is fitting the data. So this is our first quality check. That's why I'm saying it for last because now we're going into quality check. Um, and so pretty much what we want is for our Q1 and Q3 to be similar in absolute value, so 0 0.3, 0 0.3. We want our median to be close to zero, and we want our minimum and maximum to be similar to each other and also under three. So the reason why you want the absolute value of the min and max to be under three is because if it's not, then it's deviating from a normal distribution. This is the time 
you've all been waiting for. Interpreted the model output, but was it even the right model to use in the first place? So we've already loaded our package called Dharma. So please just uh, follow along. I'm going to create an object called uh, simulation output, and we use something called simulate residuals. Um, and we put our fitted model, which is a model we already made, going to plot this because the plotting is the most fun part, as we all know. So we're going to be plotting this object that we call simulation output. And I just like to run both lines at the same time. What Dharma is diagnosing as a problem in our data set is called the Levine test for homogeneity. And that's just a really fancy way of saying that the variances within our groups are not the same. So when you fail a Levine test, what it means is that in the model, a GLM assumes that there's equal variance in each of the samples. That means that we see the same spread of numbers about within each grouping. Here we have the means of each of our groups. In an ideal world, the spread of the data, how different it is, how much variation is going to be equal between all three groups. If you failed the Levine test, that doesn't mean that all of your, you know, science has failed and the experiment is wrong and that everything is going to explode. No. All I'm saying is a simple GLM with the assumptions as they are currently coded, I coded the most basic possible thing, are not suitable. Those data are not suitable for the model you chose. But lucky for us, there's a bajillion million models with a bunch of different parameters to take into account these kinds of differences we have in our data. So that isn't the problem. I'm just saying using a basic GLM just because it runs doesn't mean it's right. Please don't hate me. <laughs> okay, let's move on to something with a continuous variable because here we just use the factor to kind of give you another example. So let's keep going. <laughs> I feel like I'm gonna make a lot of enemies after this. It's the diamonds data set. So let's look, it's got bajillion variables. It looks at the carrot. Um, so I guess like that's like the size of a diamond. Uh, the cut, the color, the clarity, the depth, the table, the price. Let's look at the price of a diamond. Uh, price of the diamond. I just feel like I should talk like that. And let's predict it by, these are ordered factors, which are notoriously hard to work with. So we're not going to look at them right now. Let's just look at carrot. You might think, oh, the bigger the carrot, the higher the price, right? Those big diamonds. Um, and so we are going to now look at the summary of our model. Let's, based on what we learned from the iris thing, let's kind of go through this one, one line of learning at a time. Okay, first of all, are Q1 and Q3, are these similar in terms of absolute values? Not really. Our median should be around zero. Our maximum and minimum should be similar in value and also, remember, under three. If it's over three, what did we say? Probably not a normal distribution. So already we're finding some errors here. Wow, significant data, but we already know. We already know this is problematic, but we still look. Carrot, look at this huge positive slope. So what does this mean? As we increase carrot, we increase price. Again, I'm not going to get the Nobel Prize for this, but the model is modeling. So let's just cut the crap and go straight into running our Dharma. Let's change this update to model two. I'm going to run these two lines. The Dharma um, diagnostics are not the same um, here as for the previous one, because the previous one, we only had a single categorical predictor. Now we've got a continuous variable, right? Carrot. So now we're going to be looking at things a little bit differently. Everyone just calls it the chaos test. It's a test of normality and we've deviated from normality, which we actually kind of knew because we already looked at our deviance uh, output from the table. So now we know it's kind of cool when Dharma and your own brain come to the same conclusion. Uh, this little guy here uh, is just uh, if there are any outliers detected. Then we've got residuals. The residuals versus predicted is what we ideally want is based on this straight line for the data to be randomly distributed throughout. We do not want patterns in our residuals. 
we see a clear line going down here, we see this dotched line, whatever. Ideally, it should be like a random, beautiful, cumulus cloud around this line. What does that mean if we have patterns in our residual? We don't have enough predictors or enough information to explain the response. What that means is that carrot, this measure of diamond size, is not enough information to predict the price of a diamond. We need to give the model more information. And so we can do that. Last part, let's just make something ridiculous. And this is also because I want to show you guys one more thing of how to interpret these model outputs and something that's really important to look out for. So we've got carrot, let's add color, you know, so like the clarity of the diamond. There's another factor called table. I don't know. Let's run that. First of all, we, we already know that this model is not correct for these data because they're not normally distributed. What I wanted to show you here is when we have multiple predictors, what is our intercept, right? Like, what is this? When it's continuous, your uh, intercept automatically goes to zero. So the intercept here is color, uh, sorry, is a carat value of zero. So zero carat diamond with the color of whatever the first level here of the colors are, least quality. So the least quality with a carat of zero. Everything is compared to that. Why is this important? Does that mean anything? This is again when you have to put like your biologist hat on or whoever you are hat on. Does a carat of zero at least quality, is that like a reasonable thing to compare all of your data to? As a biologist, for example, if I'm using something like body weight, right? Body weight, continuous variable, my intercept, if I don't do anything about it, is looking, is comparing all the values to a body weight of zero, which for an animal is like 0% logical, right? You transform your data into being scaled and centered at the mean weight or the median or whatever you want it to be. But you can define this, like where your variable starts so that all of the comparisons in your table are biologically relevant to what you're doing. I hope that this was more exciting than stressful. Maybe it was a little bit stressful, but we went over GLMs, GLM outputs, and how to diagnose your GLM. Keep asking questions and don't be afraid to read your error messages. See you next time.